Now that sounds a little different. So, like I said, my name is Jason Revelo. If you really want to say it right, Jason Arevalo, okay? I am a member of Christ Family Church, a Bible teacher at Miami Christian School, a musician, a recent grad from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, but most importantly, your fellow brother in Christ. Amen. Amen. After speaking with your pastor, getting to know a bit about your church, and hearing some of the recent sermons, I was led to this verse. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. John 6, 37. So my prayer for you this morning, or for you that are watching online, is that your hearts would quake and burn for this truth. Jesus is not some disappointing alternative to whatever else the world has to offer. In fact, through faith, he provides an altogether different and all the more satisfying quality of life, eternal life with him. Amen? So let us begin where it all should begin. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the gospel according to John chapter 6. In fact, I'll turn with you there as well. We will read from chapter 6, verse 22, and go all the way through to verse 40. Church, hear the word of the Lord. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw there had been only one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never, no, never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, everyone, who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for gathering your children this morning. And for those who have not yet had that moment where they have come in faith, 
who have seen Jesus but have not truly seen who he is and what he has to give them, my prayer is this this morning, Father. Would you be working in their hearts? And in fact, would you be working in the hearts of each and every one of us, whether we are here or we are at home, would you be working in our hearts and minds and ears and hands to be open and willing to receive you? Father, would you bless this time that we have here this morning? Would you prepare our hearts as we turn to see what it is you have to teach us from your word? I pray these things in the mighty name, the precious name of your son, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, church, I want to ask you something this morning. Do you ever fear whether you are truly a Christian, or are you really enjoying eternal life? Listen, I have been a Christian long enough to see plenty of people who claim to be believers and simply walked away. And I don't know about you, but for me, it can stir some worry and fear for my own life with God, right? But as I mentioned earlier, through faith, Jesus provides an altogether different and all the more satisfying quality of life, eternal life with him. So here is our driving question this morning. How does Jesus provide eternal life to us? How does Jesus provide eternal life to us? Well, number one, Jesus exposes our faithlessness. These crowds had just been miraculously given food by Jesus. In fact, This is one of the most well-attested miracles of Jesus. Whether you go to the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you can find it spoken of in each and every Gospel. So on the face of it, the crowd's response may seem noble enough. Jesus performs his miracles, the crowds go looking for him. And when they find him, they're even so dignified as to call him Rabbi. However, Jesus spends no time entertaining their pleasantries. He quickly recognizes, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. In other words, it wasn't a faithful heart which led you back to me. It was your hunger for food. You weren't looking for the Messiah. You were looking for another helping of manna. I think we can all agree it is clear how little Jesus is in the eyes of these people. They were working for food that perishes rather than seeking what the Son of Man had to give. But what may not be so clear to us is how often we ourselves are no different. For some of us, it is reflected in our prayers. Lord, would you please give me that job? Because if I have it, then I can be satisfied. Or for others of us, it is reflected in the way we perform at school or work. Hey, if I, if I could just accomplish all the tasks I've been assigned, then I can finally get the approval of my boss or teacher. And yet others still, it is reflected in the home. Oh, how I wish my dad would recognize me for my achievements. I wish he loved me more. Hear me on this. I'm not saying God is opposed to any of these things. Praise God for jobs he's given to us. And for any time he gives opportunities to advance at our school or workplace. And yeah, when he gives us a peaceful home with a loving family, amen? Praise God for these things. But I'm saying this. When we merely work for satisfaction in the areas of finance, family, reputation, or otherwise... We strive for things which do not last. Listen, no amount of money will ever make you feel like you have enough. No amount of love from your family can sustain the needs of your heart. And no amount of approval from others will ever make you feel assured. There is but one word we should hear to end all our striving. One spoken to give relief for our souls. One to silence our heart's constant neediness to be right in the eyes of others. And that one word 
indeed is a name, Jesus. And this is what Jesus held out for the crowds to see. They failed to follow what the signs showed them. Here is your Messiah. The issue was in their seeing. So I ask you this morning, church, where are your eyes fixed? What is it you wish to see? Because I promise you, if your gaze is only ever fixed downward, you will inevitably be led to disappointment. And if your gaze is fixed ever only inward, you'll be left feeling empty and distressed. Perhaps we need the sober and continual reminder of the Gentile foreigners who said to Philip, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. It reminds me of this old song that said, In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. But with that reminder, this is my prayer that you also have eyes to see, you are not him. You might be thinking to yourself, but Brother Jason, that is obvious. Of course I know I'm not Jesus. Why are you saying that? I'm saying that because I truly think more often than we would care to admit, we give ourselves a place which belongs to him alone. We run our own race as though we alone had legs to win. Perhaps we accumulate honors and accolades as though our reputation counted for something. Or we constantly defend ourselves in arguments as though we can never be wrong. But I am here to tell you this. If that is you, if you are just trying to build up a stock of good works as though by them you can be found to prove You are working for food that perishes. Because without Christ, we will lose the race, accumulate futile honors, always be wrong, and ultimately find ourselves rejected. Your salvation is found through faith in Christ alone. That means Jesus plus nothing is our salvation. Can I get an amen from the people of God? Which leads us to the next point. How does Jesus provide eternal life to us, you ask? He does it not only by exposing our faithlessness, but also, number two, Jesus preserves our faith. So the question asked by the crowds is this. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. I want you immediately to notice a detail that is easy to miss. The crowds ask, what can they do to perform the works of God? But Jesus answers by saying that this is the work of God, to believe in the one he has sent. The crowds ask, about works, plural. Jesus answers with an emphatic singular work. It is almost as though Jesus dares to say, there is but one thing that God calls you to, and that is to believe in me. Almost as though he is saying, without me, all other work is not of God. Now I know what some of you might be thinking. Well then, what role do works play? Are we not to live a life worthy of the call we have been given? Are we not to live as a holy people set apart from the rest of the world? You may even remember what Paul said to the Romans in his letter. Should I sin that grace may abound? By no means, right? 
But Paul also says in verses 5 and 6 of that chapter, if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Church, the reason why God particularly calls for belief in the Christ he has sent is because it is the only way anyone will truly be free. Well, what do I mean by that? Sin is like a tyrannical ruler. It is cosmic treason against the king of kings. But for the one who believes in the son, freedom from this tyrant is theirs. Through faith in Jesus, the penalty of sin has been satisfied. Through faith in Jesus, the power of sin is being destroyed. And through faith in Jesus, even the presence of sin will one day be entirely removed. Amen? Listen to me. The only thing which grants me this freedom is belief in the one God has sent. Without him, all other works will lead to one thing, slavery to sin. Beloved, do you get this? The problem here is not the works. When my sister, actually, who's here this morning, who is 11 years old and a musician, plays a beautiful concert, I celebrate that. Or when I see students walk across the graduation stage, I applaud them for their achievement, right? But as my fa grandfather has said, good works are not a contradiction to my salvation. However, if I trust in my good works as my righteousness, if I trust in them as my assurance or approval before God, or if I hope they will provide me with the ultimate satisfaction my, whole, my soul needs, then I just have to tell you, I'm a fool. I am a fool because no amount of good works can fill the infinite gap between a sinner like me and a holy God. I rely upon another to reconcile the difference. Amen? Church, I'm not saying this as one who has it fully figured out. Whether it's in the car as I drive or quiet moments when I'm alone, I too question them at times. Am I truly saved? Or when I face some of my own sin issues, and boy, do we all have them. Does this mean I'm not truly a child of God? No. It is exactly in those moments I am reminded, not by my will, nor by my might, but by the merits of Christ, am I saved? Amen? Amen. Look, the crowds follow this up with another set of questions in verses 30 and 31. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe in you? They asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, well, Jesus, if you want us to have faith in you, what sign are you going to perform? You say the work we are to perform is to believe in you. But what work are you going to perform for us then? We'll believe you when we see it. So they realize the radical claims Jesus is making. This man calls upon God as his own father. And in contrast to their traditions which taught them, they are to perform various works, not just faith. Jesus calls them to a singular work of faith in him. Therefore, it isn't surprising they are asking for a sign, right? The problem is, Jesus had already held out signs for them to see and even taste with the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. They sound like pious people, even citing Moses to back them up. But the reality is, it did not matter how many signs, miracles, and wonders Jesus could perform for them. They just came expecting to receive what any other Roman emperor or politician could give them. 
a handout. They failed to realize the beauty of what Jesus, the true Messiah, had to offer himself. So not only does Jesus provide eternal life by exposing our faithlessness and preserving our faith in him, but in response to the crowd's demand for another sign, something pointing, he points to the Father. Look at what it says in verses 32 and 33. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus shows how even the crowd's appeal to Moses was faulty because they failed to recognize one greater than Moses was here. Jesus, the true bread given by God the Father. This reveals an important insight concerning the nature of God. True bread comes from the God who is a life-giving Father. As theologians traditionally illustrate, he is like a fountain which pours out and spills over with water. He is like the sun who shines out with light and life. And what shines out, you may ask? What spills over? It is the eternal life which springs forth, overflowing from the eternal life of God. (sighs) That's amazing. The Father shares with us that intimate communion he has with the Son and the Spirit because this is what God is like. He is a father who has always loved his son. And the son, who is himself God, has always loved his father. And both have eternally related this way in the unity of the Holy Spirit. This God, who holds together any logic of life, light, and love, is so overabundant in these that he stoops to graciously offer it to the world. So why settle for manna, which fills for but a moment, when you can have true bread, which fills you with the divine life for eternity? Now, I realize that when we hear the word father, we all have varying reactions. Some of you hear father, and swarms of sweet memories flood our minds and hearts, right? Others hear the word father, and there's a cold, perhaps even unnerving feeling that comes over us. Whichever the case, let me tell you, God the Father is not like your earthly father. And that's a good thing. Because even though our earthly fathers are meant to serve as pictures of this father, they inevitably fall short. They're sinners, just like you and me. Not so with God. He demonstrated his great love for us by sending his son into the world, even while we were yet his enemies. And this son did what no other earthly son could. He accomplished our salvation. Listen, church, when you place your faith in Jesus, something changes. At one time, you were slaves to the various passions of your heart, the currents of the world, and the tyranny of sin. But because Christ, who is our life, came into the world, what he has changed is our status. We are no longer slaves, but have been adopted as sons and daughters. Jesus provides us eternal life by pointing to his Father. And now, by grace, through faith alone, this Father is our Father. Amen? So finally, we reach the culmination of this back and forth between Jesus and the crowds. Because Jesus provides us with eternal life 
not only by exposing our faithlessness, preserving our faith, and pointing to our Father, but he also does it by proclaiming his faithfulness. The crowds finally stop asking questions and simply tell Jesus, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus responds as clear as day, I am the bread of life. The crowds have been told their work for bread is not enough because the work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. This one sent from the Father is the true bread which gives life to the world, and his name is Jesus. Andreas Kostenberger, a New Testament scholar, tells us that the references to bread here combine to identify Jesus as the giver of life. This is why Jesus keeps emphasizing that he is the bread of life. All other bread merely provides for a meal. Jesus, the true bread, provides for eternity. So what does Jesus, the bread of life, proclaim he will do for those who come to him? He answers that question with our remaining verses. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I don't know about you, but when I hear and read these verses, it is like receiving a cascading bomb of beauty. How much clearer could Jesus make it? The one who comes to me, I will never cast out. I will lose none of those the Father has given me. The one who sees and believes in me will have eternal life. And that one, I will raise him up on the last day. These are precious promises, my brothers and sisters. They give testimony of Jesus' faithfulness. His faithfulness even goes beyond just being faithful to you and me. To turn his back on those who come to him in faith would be tantamount to the son turning his back on the will of the father. And let me tell you, that's impossible. <laughs> the father, son, and Holy Spirit are not in some kind of competition with each other. The unity of God cannot be and is never frustrated. So Jesus, of the same essence with the Father, and true to his nature, has been and always will be a faithful son. Beloved, I know we want to be assured of our salvation. So I'm here to tell you, the only one who can truly give that to you is Jesus. Imagine for a moment if we inverted these promises, inserting ourselves. No one who comes to Jason will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in Jason will ever be thirsty again. That would be absurd, and you would be right to call it foolish. But I would say the same thing to any who go anywhere else but Jesus to be assured of their salvation. No amount of good works will ever prove that to me. Jesus, the object of your faith, is the assurance of your salvation. Amen? Now, how many of you are familiar with the author John Bunyan? Just by a raise of hands. You know, you may know him for the famous Christian allegory, Pilgrim's Progress. Anyone know Pilgrim's Progress? Well, he wrote another book 
which entirely focused on this one little verse, John 6, 37, that I had mentioned at the beginning of the sermon. If you would allow me, I'd like for us to linger on that verse a bit. And as we do, I'd like to share some of Bunyan's reflections with you. Here is what he says. They that are coming to Jesus Christ are oftentimes very afraid that Jesus Christ will not receive them. This observation is implied in the text. I gather it from the largeness and openness of the promise. I will in no wise cast out what here says I will never cast out. For had there not been a proneness in us to fear casting out, Christ needed not to have waylaid our fear as he does by this great and strange expression, in no wise. For this word, in no wise, cuts the throat of all objections, and it was dropped by the Lord Jesus for that purpose, and to help the faith that is mixed with unbelief. And it is, as it were, the sum of all promises. Neither can any objection be made upon the unworthiness that you find in yourself that this promise will not assoil. Now listen to this. But I am a great sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am an old sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am a hard-hearted sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am a backsliding sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have served Satan all my days, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against light, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against mercy, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have no good thing to bring with me, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. This promise was provided to answer all objections and does answer them. Beloved, the reason why I can trust Jesus when he holds out these promises, is because he is faithful. He is not like all the other food I eat and quickly get hungry again. He is the bread of life. When I simply trust in him, believing the promises he has made, I can rest assured he will take me all the way home, for this is the work of God. I do not need to live a life trying to prove myself to others. I do not need to build up my own righteousness to pay for entry at the gates of heaven. Jesus is my righteousness. And when I call upon his name, those gates will swing right open. And when they do, I will hear the Father to whom Jesus pointed, calling me by name to enter. Because Jesus ever faithful, is and has given for me the bread of life, eternal life with him. As the worship team comes up, let me share something with you. A number of years ago, while I was away from home and engaged in my college studies, there was a difficult season I entered into. Yes, I think I truly believed in God at the time, but my heart was wrestling to believe that God was good. I knew of his power, but it made him seem far and aloof. Did this high and mighty God really care for me, or was I simply an instrument of his capricious desires? Questions like these settled and grew in my heart until I became embittered and resentful toward God. And so for that season, I gave up on any effort to seek him. I went to more parties than I can remember, got drunk often, smoked, slept around, and all in a deep pit of depression 
and anxiety. The truth is, I was tirelessly looking for anything and everything that could fill the God-shaped gap in my soul. I was living a life of reckless, hedonistic abandon. And all the while, my resentment against God just stewed. The school year ended, and I was exhausted. I just wanted to go home, lock myself away in a room for a while, and be left alone. But instead, for some reason, I reluctantly decided to go on a week-long Christian retreat with some friends. And while I was there, I participated in a close study of the Gospel of Mark. Now realize, initially, my skepticism had not gone away. In fact, I remember telling people uh, going into that week, you know, God is going to try and woo me back over to him, and I am not going to let him. Boy, was I wrong. Because as I studied the gospel of Mark, it was like I was meeting Jesus all over again. Every objection I had to the character of God, Jesus dismantled them one by one by one. I believed God had no compassion for me. Jesus showed his mercy. I believe God did not care for me. Jesus walked with and loved his disciples. And I believe that God was not good. But Jesus shattered that idea because he was, he is, and he always will be good. This wayward and foolish sinner, Jesus looked in the eye and said, all the Father gives to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. So beloved, whatever season of life you're in, whatever obstacles you are dealing with, wherever you are in your walk with God, hear the precious words of the Savior. The one who comes to me, I will never cast out. Do you get that, church? It isn't about you. God doesn't want you to live questioning whether you have eternal life. He wants you to live free. Do you believe that? Because if you do, then trust him. Trust him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the precious promises that you have given to us in your son, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I know that I am not the only one in this room who can tell story after story of times of waywardness, times of just looking after so many other things except your son, Jesus. Maybe even now, there are those in this room who are saying to themselves, yeah, even now, even now, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. And Lord, my prayer is for them. Because these words, I believe, God, you have given for them to hear. Oh, don't stay there. Don't stay there alone. Don't stay there. Hear the Savior who has his arms outstretched welcoming you to embrace him. And he will hold you. He will hold you and take you all the way home to me. Father, would you be continuing to work in hearts, minds, and lives today and beyond today, ministering to them the precious truths that have come from your word. I ask that anything, anything that came from me and not from you, that you would remove it and that the work that continues past this morning will be yours. I pray these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.